Welcome to the Future of Ground Transportation podcast, where we discuss the exciting innovations that lie ahead for organizational ground transportation. Each episode, we cover topics tailored to those resolving transportation-related challenges and provide tips, tools, and trends that will inspire you to stay ahead of the curve. And now, here's your host, Daniel Perez. Welcome to the Future of Ground Transportation. Today, we have Lance Jensen, the Executive Director of Transportation and Fleet Services for Arlington Public School System. Lance, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I'm I'm excited to be here, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Lance. So, uh, let's let's get into the weeds. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started in the uh, transportation sector, and a little background about yourself overall. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm about 20 year vet in people transportation. Uh, I've done a variety of jobs from driving a school bus to actually running a department. By the only thing I can't do is probably fix a bus. And with my skill set, I don't know if you want me to, but anything on the outside of it that, that is a thought, I feel like I'm really confident and competent. In. Um, I started my journey in 2001 in Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, it's probably one of the top 10 sides district-wise as far as uh, education in America. It's located right outside of D.C. Uh, I drove there for about four years and then relocated to Georgia, um, where I ended up being in a district called Marietta, Georgia. Marietta is about 20 miles south of Atlanta, and it's a small city with big city dreams. Um, I was nominated and won one of the best cities in America, like mid 2016 another time in 2019 or something like that. But anyway, so we had, they had a really big ego and we really proud of ourselves on service. So that's kind of where I started my leadership journey. Um, after that, I was promoted to a supervisor position in a rural county in Georgia, which is Carroll County, which is probably 20 minutes I-20 west from Alabama. Um, and I really learned a lot about myself there and then we migrated back to Marietta where we kind of excelled in this industry. Um, in 2017, I was appointed assistant director of transportation. And at that time, we were really, really innovative as far as our district. We had a really aggressive superintendent. We'd like to be the first one in the pool. And we were as aggressive as you can be. We also, we launched a parallel that same year. Um, and a year and a half later, we were able to introduce uh, student ridership. Uh, we were one of the first districts in Georgia to have both uh, the Paranap and student ridership. Uh, because of that, we won a couple of awards. Um, Georgia ranks their districts. They have what's called a blue, um, blue grass ribbon award and the green grass, green ribbon award. We won both. I'm there in my time as assistant director. And we also were recognized by Tyler Technologies um, for our innovation and our ability to be able to push out and utilize the parent app. Um, but of course, the pandemic changed everything. Um, it made people refocus, uh, reshift their energy. I mean, at the time, 60 Minutes did a bio on a couple of districts during a pandemic in 2021, and Marietta was one of those districts. So at that time, our entire district was um, able to let people in during a pandemic. And because of that, I found like my um, attractiveness as a, a player in this game was at an all time high, and my kids were back here in Virginia. So at that point in time, we applied for some jobs. I went back to Fairfax County as an operations manager in 2021. And in, as of July of 2023, I was appointed the executive director of transportation and fleet service for Arlington Public Schools. If you don't know, Arlington County is the same area where the Pentagon is. So we're right outside of DC. We have about 27,000 students. Uh, we run about 180 buses. And it's 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 been a wonderful journey ever since. So yeah, now we're here today with you, Mr. Daniel. Thank you, Lance. Appreciate the, uh, the the context. So, how many buses in total, and how many students again? Probably about twenty-seven thousand students, and we have about one hundred and eighty buses. One hundred eighty buses. Got got. It. So, with one hundred and eighty buses and twenty-seven thousand students, what are the biggest challenges that, as a as a director of transportation, do you currently see right now in the market for us? For us, there's two things, Daniel, which every director, every district pretty much in our, in our country is facing is the driver shortage. Um, 
the ability to find qualified candidates. Qualified candidates are such a, a premium that the Commonwealth of Virginia has now even established for us to track qualified candidates. Because the notion is, uh, unlike some jobs, you know, a classified job in an industry, um, food service or, you know, our custodial staff, you can pull someone off the street that has a clean background um, and you can train them. But for our industry and, and transportation, you know, there's, there's a whole government over, there's a whole government that's going to overseas commercial driving. And so we have to ensure that people can qualify for that as well. And that is a, that in itself is, is tough. So those be, have to become qualified candidates. Where we're at, um, we're in Metro DC. So in our 30 mile radius, you have some of the biggest districts in the nation, Montgomery County and Fairfax. Um, and then you have, you know, Prince William, um, these are some huge players, uh, Prince George's County in Maryland. And so we're all fighting for the same qualified candidates because, you know, we're all looking. So as if you're a commercial driver, uh, you have a class B with a KNS endorsement right now, you, you have so many options because everyone's looking for, for drivers. And so we're fighting for the same candidates. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we face as the man style skyrocketed since the pandemic, but ways for us to be able to assist in our students getting educated. Yep. Uh, I am having those questions the issue. Totally. And when you mentioned PNS, again, for the, the listeners that might not be familiar with that abbreviation, what is the uh, PNS endorsement? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the PNS endorsement, the P stands for passenger endorsement. Um, the Baylor driver commercial vehicle with the odds of more than 16 passengers, you will need a P or their commercial driver's license, and the S is for school bus. Got it. Awesome. So what are you guys doing to to mitigate those that, that liability and that shortage of qualified drivers? It's funny that you mentioned that because uh, in Boston and New York, we actually – created our own CDL training uh, business so that way we could sort of nurture our own drivers and place them into our our workforce because the talent is so limited. Um, So what are the alternatives that you guys are doing and what innovation um, ways are you guys doing to recruit and maintain drivers? And by the way, how many drivers in total? Yeah, great question. Uh, for us, I feel like we're all kind of doing the same thing. We're just throwing money at the hourly rate, thinking that that's going to entice um, uh, our candidates. And to me, one of the biggest things we really have to look at, you know, is we have to revamp our entire thought process on what a school bus driver in my industry is. Um, it's a part-time job that has full-time benefits and has part-time hours. But to be able to compete in this transportation industry, I feel like we have to look at this position and be in a full-time position. Um, so currently, our drivers do work 11 months. I know a lot of districts, they normally work 10 months, 180 days. Our drivers are 222 days, which, of course, in the education industry, the more days you work, which normally means the more money that you make. Um, so that's that's a real neat thing for us. Um, it may cause some dissatisfaction for some people because they like having the summers off. But again, if you're out here trying to support your family, knowing that you you have uh, 11 months that you're going to be employed, uh, that's something that you can, you know, you can hang your hat on it and have that security. Uh, one of the things we're also doing as well as we're doing the CDL prep class where we are assisting people with um, the permit part because there's two parts to get your CDL. There's a written part, just like the license you have to take. And then there's an actual driving test where you physically go behind the wheel of a commercial vehicle to get it. Uh, the CDL partner test is it for the light of heart. Um, it's extensive. Um, the test can be tricky. They can ask you the same question several times and word it differently. And so that's some of the issues we see where we lose some candidates. So we have started as of July 1, we will have a free a CDL permit prep class. Uh, we will pay people to come and take that class. And hopefully that will allow us, kind of like what you said, Dan, to get them in our system. Um, they get vested once they get the permit, and then we will hopefully increase our numbers. Because normally, again, our retention rate, when you have a class, it's normally 50%. So we're just trying to figure out ways to, to change that number and get it more closer to a 70 80%. But it's only 50%, and most of it's because people can't possibly get a CDL permit or they can't pass the CDL test. How many candidates were normally pass a, a class 
I just said, if you have 40 students, out of those 40 students, what's your success rate? Right now, we're about 50%. So we started class with 40. By the end of it, we're probably the 10, 20. Uh, oh, wow. That's for a variety of reasons, you know, whether they miss days, whether they struggle with the written part, or when we get to the CDO portion, they just can't pass, right? Because um, at some point, you have to cut your losses. You know, you've, you've invested a lot of time on money in these candidates, and you have to be able to say, hey, you know what, we've gone as far as we can. I'm just as far as we can go. So right now, it's about 50%. Got it. And and Lance, for context, how many drivers in total, in total do you oversee? We currently were slated for 157 drivers. That's our that's our full time equivalent. So we have 157 drivers and 75 attendants. We currently are we're staffed by 134 drivers. So we have a small shortage not as big as some of our other districts uh, that would surround us, but we still have a shortage. Got it. And when it comes to fleet, uh, what is the what is the biggest opportunity that you guys see for improvement? What is the challenges when it comes to, to the fleet? The vehicles themselves, um, for us, Arlington, we're a small congested county, 26.2 square miles. Um, but we do have a lot of students, right? So we may not travel a lot of miles. And one thing about, if you know anything about the makeup of Arlington, we're heavily congested. We're, we're in the middle, we're right on the brink of people getting to and from D.C. coming into Virginia um, on 395, which is where the depending on is. So we're heavily congested. So a lot of the issues we have is our buses are huge, our streets are small, our roads are small. And so those are some of the challenges we have with our fleet. Uh, maintaining a, a fleet that doesn't have a lot of dings and scratches on it, but it's tough because it's Arlington. Um, but try to figure out the ball what's the right size bus for us to have with our streets and our, and our geographical makeup. Uh, it's probably a huge challenge for us. Got it. And um, being the director of transportation in general, what sort of innovations would you like to see in the transportation space or in your space to make your job easier or the writer's uh, journey easier? Well, coming from a district where we did student ridership, Daniel, I feel like in 2024, parents have access to their, their to their children at all times, right? They have cell phones. Yeah. Where's my iPhone? Like 360. And so for us to be a lot more efficient, uh, student ridership can really help in that. Knowing where, where you know, what bus the student got on and knowing where they got off, if they got off, um, that real-time data is important uh, because, you know, Parents are the their level of anxiety is at an all time high, and so a lot of our calls we get is you know little Johnny one on the bus. We can't, he's not at the stop. He's not at the bus. He's not at the school. Where's little Johnny? And for us not to be able to say, hey, we got on the bus at you know three fifteen and seventeen seconds. He got off at first and second at three you know, three thirty and nineteen seconds. I'm not hiding that. You know that that could be a huge disadvantage. Um, that's how our perception is viewed from the public as far as safety. So I would like to see a lot more districts, including our own, um, actually start the process of looking at student rivalship. Uh, then the second part is figuring out these alternative vehicle, uh, what the next wave is going to be. I'm a huge fan of EV. I think we ran into a spot, though, where I think a lot of the people on the outside of our industry doesn't do not understand the amount of cost that our infrastructure is going to have to inherit to make that happen. And especially in my industry where we educate students is our primary goal, taking $300 million away from students' learning to put it in an infrastructure. Sometimes that's a tough sale to the general public, right? And so, but they want the vehicle. So try to figure out what the next way. If it's gonna be hydrogen, that's great, right? Like I'm here for it. It's not as a huge overhead cost as far as infrastructure, but those vehicles are expensive. You're talking 800,000 to a million dollars for those vehicles. So. Just figuring out what the next way is going to be. Correct. Yes. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because every obviously in this in this show we talk about a lot about electrical vehicles, and the the lack of understanding from not only from the public but from the consumers about electrical vehicles, not really understanding how how expensive these vehicles are, and someone is going to have to pay for it, and who's going to be in charge of the consequences of the bill 
and and is it really worth the ROI by the time that we have a next wave coming in and changing the whole infrastructure? It's a dynamic that I'm excited to to be part of, and which is why I love having these conversations. We have some electrical vehicles uh, between Boston and New York, but just the infrastructure and the equipment itself is humongous. And then on top of it, the infrastructure, whether it's technicians, whether it's the roads, is significant high. So it's it's pretty remarkable how we how we penetrate it little by little into the electrical vehicles. But I think by the time that we sort of conquer that wave, a new wave is going to come in right away. Yeah, and Daniel, I've, uh, in these two past decades, I've seen you know, CNG. We've seen you know there was a gas wave. Uh, there is a huge propane wave, and, and you know you see these alternative vehicles pop up, and you know and. They're great and seems like I said, for our industry and education, it, it's time to hit the infrastructure. And, you know, and especially in Arlington, where then it is no space, right? Like, <laughs> there's no space in Arlington that yeah, you can only build up. A lot of our schools actually have parking garages, right? Like, you know, in the elementary school, the actual parking garage, because there's no land. So, where are we going to one, get the capital to be able to fund this project? I think, two, where is it going to go? There is no existing space. In which we can create this and so like you said educating the trip the public on it um and it's been tough because of the wave of ev vehicles as far as you know cars but if you're paying attention you know all those companies like tesla their stocks are down right and because i think we're getting to a place where we the data leads will start making sense um and i think we're getting there where people want to see the results in the long run. i think people get a little i think they're starting to ask the right questions but again, like you said, you know, hydrogen is the next wave. And so by the time we figure out EV, then it'll be all, well, hydrogen buses are 500000 which won't cost them out of infrastructure, right? You just have to get a hydrogen tank. And, you know, so hopefully before I, I, I'm done with this, I got a long way to go. Um, we will see what the next wave is. I'm interested in it. But of course, it has to make sense. For totally. And when it comes like, to, to flying vehicles and autonomous vehicles, how do you see ourselves in the future transporting our, our kids to school? I think from a personal standpoint, it'd be great if I didn't have a robot because, you know, we're, we're human. And so, you know, that way we don't have the discipline issues we have. You know, we can ensure that the robots, right, or it's AI or whoever's driving the vehicle will follow the rules, right? All the rules of the road, they'll make the right turns. Um, that part would be great for safety. I think the impact that we'll have is, you know, for a lot of our kids, a lot of our students, a bus driver has a huge impact on their day-to-day life. Um, it's kind of someone who they connect with outside the school building. I think a lot of us who took who rode people transportation during our our primary years and our secondary years as far as school, we remember our favorite bus driver. That's the type of impact. And we remember the worst driver, right? So that's the huge impact that they have. We'll probably lose that. I guess the question would be, is that worth the trade-off? Probably so, right? Because that means we'll have less accidents that are our fault. Because um, at some point, you know, if the robot has an accident, I'm assuming the other person had done something wrong. So, you know, there's a huge benefit, but then we lose the human hourly, the human touch of it. And, you know, something that makes, that makes it a little difficult, but hopefully we'll get there. You know, AI and all this technology is a wonderful thing if, if it works the way it needs to. A hundred percent. And what are you excited about for the remaining of 2024 and 2025 when it comes to technology and and uh, the future of transportation and, and innovative initiatives that are happening in, in the space? I'm really, really excited for where this is going. Um, there's a lot of vendors out here who are really, really trying to capitalize on this AI technology. Um, the ability to see driver errors real time, and, you know, run a report for you. Uh, Gatekeeper, which is a you know their surveillance company, they have like this 360 view of the bus, right? It's in the rear view mirror. So as the driver is driving, they actually have an overhead, like in some of our cars, have an overhead view of your surrounding area. So you can watch out for students. Um, and you're backing up the bus, you have this great aerial view of what's behind you, what's to the side of you for safety reasons. So I'm really, really excited to see these type of things be integrated into our industry hopefully fake facial recognition, right? So now instead of student ridership, a kid scans a card, you know, they step up on the bus, the camera recognizes their face, 
boom, oh, automatically sends a, you know, an alert to the tablet that, hey, this kid's supposed to be on the bus, right? I know that's the direction we're going. I'm, I'm a technology junkie. Um, I'm a data nerd. And so it's it's going to be great to see these things be integrated into our industry. Hopefully, I'm still around for it when it happens. But I think some of those things are going to be here sooner rather than later. Totally, totally. And what is the best personal advice or, or business advice through your career lens that you could share with the listeners? I have a saying, it's actually on my resume. Um, it's something that I live by. The saying is we celebrate, rarely we grind daily. Um, and for me, it's always, you know, it's great to have a success, a win, but the next thing you should be looking for the next, what the next thing is going to be. And so that's what I mean by we celebrate rarely. We have accomplishments, you know, they're great for resume building and your interview purposes. But again, you know, if you're the saying, I think, I can't remember the coach that said it. I think it was Lou Holtz. If you're not getting better, by, def by default, you're getting worse, right? It's a competition mm -hmm. game. And so if you're innovative, you're always looking for the next edge. So you're always looking uh, to continue to grow and continue to be better. So those are two things that we try to live by every day. Totally, totally. Awesome. And um, to wrap things up, Lance, what's the uh, best books or recommendations that you recommend for the listeners? I'm a leadership guy. My leadership's all about service. If you haven't read 213, uh, it's a book. It's a leadership book. It's an amazing book if you have a team of people that, that you work with. Uh, essentially, that you all can do is, yeah. Uh, it's the temperature that water boils. Let's keep it off camera. But it's the temperature that water boils at. And basically what it does is it creates pressure, right? And so if you really as a, as a team, you can really build your team. Um, it, it makes you guys go into the depths of some of the issues, communication issues. And if everyone really, you know, if they really get involved with it, it can be a great thing to build your team. So um, that's a book that we kind of live by. I live by a lot of those principles, so that's a good read. Awesome, awesome. Well, perfect. Again, I wanted to uh, thank you for being part of the show, for providing educational for for the listeners tonight. Thank you for being part of the show. And um, for all the listeners that join us today, we want to thank you for joining us tonight and stay tuned for the next upcoming podcast. All right. Have a great night. Thank you, Lance. Thank you for having me. Good night. Thanks for tuning in to the future of ground transportation. We appreciate you coming along for the ride. If you found value in this episode and want to hear more, please make sure to subscribe to the show.